and welcome to the Help My Wealth podcast, Money Rules or Money Rules. Here at Help My Wealth, we are all about empowering financial success in our community of listeners. We hope you find today's topic both informative and helpful. Hi, and welcome back to the Help My Wealth podcast, Money Rules, Money Rules. I'm your host, Stephen Logan, and with me always is Hamish Ferguson. Hamish, thank you for coming. You're welcome, Steve. Have you had a good week? It has. It's, it's Good Friday tomorrow, so it's it's a short week, which is good in some ways, not so good in others. Just depends on who you're talking to. Absolutely. <laughs> and with us today is our guest, and Matthew Skeen. Thank you, Matthew, for joining us. You're welcome. How's your work been, Matthew? Uh, again, short, but uh, very busy. I'm still uh, finalising emails before I head out the door for a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matthew is a licensed financial planner with over 22 years' experience in the financial planning industry. He started his career in Westpac Bank uh, for 14 years and then moved into your own practice, which is Elevate Finance, in 2012. Yes. So what made you um, come across that decision? Um I think there was a natural progression for financial planners that were mm-hmm. doing a lot themselves and you know chasing business and... Um, after a lot of encouragement from my own clients um, to get out on my own, I decided to make the move after a while before I got too institutionalised in the bank. Yeah. And um, I haven't looked back since. Well, Matt has built his advice business uh, with around financial strategies, including wealth accumulation, self-managed super funds, personal insurance advice, Centrelink and retirement advice. Yes. And I do love the mantra that I heard you like, which is good advice is your best investment. Yes. And you highly encourage people to invest in themselves. Absolutely. So where did that sort of come from? Um, probably from our own careers, we're always learning and, and changing uh, directions um, for ourselves and for our clients. So um, where our job is to empower clients to um, have more education about their um, their personal situation and how they can better themselves. Mm. Um, so the more education um, that we can have, or the more we invest into our own knowledge, then uh, the better off we're going to be in the long term. Yeah, yeah. I think it was that book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that talked about the idea of sharpening your axe. Mm. You know, you can, you know, get into cutting down trees, but if your axe is blunt, yep. it's going to take you a lot longer to, to achieve it. You know, you sit down for 20 minutes and sharpen it up, you know, get the education, get the right professionals in place, you yes. can actually do the job yep. a, lot, a lot more effectively, a lot quicker. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. So, Matt, I wanted to start today. I wanted to ask you, you know, being a financial planner, how has that helped you personally with your finances? I'm sure you get a lot of people assuming that as a financial planner, you should just be a, uh, you know, multi-cazillionaire yeah. floating around on a boat somewhere. But, uh, you not know, quite. not quite, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose for myself, I'm, uh, I've always been a, a goal-oriented person. Mm-hmm. So I've always, if I wanted to achieve something, um, I've made sure that I, I go out and get it um, as much as I can within my power. So um, working in the finance industry, uh, it took me a little bit to find my feet and, mm-hmm. and, you know, how does finance work? How does it help me? What, you know, solutions are available for me? Um, but it allowed me to set goals for... for Myself and my family to you know, pay off the home loan early, and we, we did that well ahead of time, um, and that allowed me then to progress into running my own business and you know setting goals for that, and then for retirement as well. So um, you know, I, it, it's helped me you know in a number of ways in in that regard to be very goal oriented, mm. which is what we're uh, trying to get our our customers to be. Mm. Mm. I, I find as well, though, that it creates misconceptions, doesn't it? Like it can, you know, again, like Steve was saying, that, you know, it, it, there can be this assumption that or if you're a financial advisor, you know all the top tips, yep. you know, to, mm. to, to make this quick journey to success. And and also at home it can be an issue too in the sense that, um, you know, if, if finances from a family perspective mm. is quite often... Um, you know, it's a family job. It's not just a personal job, isn't it? So yeah. You've got to be able to get the team on board when Absolutely. it comes to the home. Yes. Um, how have you found that? Um, well, it's funny that when I'm talking to clients and even, you know, if I'm talking to my wife, there's always one person who's more conservative and they will let someone else take control of the finances in any sort of relationship. Um, and, you know, because this is my job, my wife says, yeah, I trust you to do that job and do it well. Yeah, that's your job. <laughs> so we don't lose the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, um, yeah, so there, there can be that challenge where a lot of people don't agree and I can see that with my clients. You know, one wants to set up a self-managed super fund, the other person isn't so keen because they all they see is the risks whereas the other one sees all the benefits for it. Mm. And I think, you know, if I can take that one step further, sometimes, um, you know, you'll come across, you know, and it could be us in our relationships, it could be someone else where they are given a lot more responsibility around money. Mm. But by nature, then the other person can sometimes be at risk of not developing their own knowledge because they're assuming you're doing it. Right? Yes, so, that's exactly right. And, and that by nature, I think, ends up being the more conservative person because mm. they don't have that knowledge to, to to decipher the processes we go through. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Um, so it, it really does need to be a joint process mm. to actually go on this journey, doesn't it? Yes. Like, you know, husband and wife, whether you're a financial planner or not. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, you both have to have that buy-in and, um, and then obviously educating your kids, that's a whole other level of um, trauma in itself. <laughs> <laughs> I know with coaching, one of the things I always say is, look, you know, someone's always going to take the lead on different areas of your life, you know, be it the gardening, be it the cooking, be it the financial planning, whichever person it is in the relationship, it doesn't really matter. Mm. The other person still needs to be involved somewhat. You yes. know? So I always encourage people to sit down once a week, once a fortnight, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and, and just go over the budget. You know, have you actually achieved your budget this month? Is it what you wanted to achieve and, and go from there? Yep. Yeah. The number of times I've said to a 14, 15 or 16-year-old, and when you talk about budgeting or their first job or whatever, and you go, do you realise people pay me for this information? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're getting free advice. You're getting free, and you're ignoring it. That's just ignoring ridiculous. It. Yes, yes. They just look at you and go, sure, Dad. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> what do you know? I'm taking my $80 that I've earned and buying a jacket. <laughs> That's crazy. So, look, mate, one of the things I always like asking people in the financial industry is, mm. has there been a truth that you've come across or some truths that you've come across that you go, that is really good advice. I don't tend to follow it myself. Mm. I wish I did. You know, like what's something that you go, if I've been doing that since I was 25, mm. this is the position I'd be in now. If I went back to my 25-year-old self and knew what I knew now, I'd probably make a lot more money because I'd yeah. probably take a lot more risks. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think taking risks is um, something that we need to do but be comfortable mm. and measured in taking those risks. Yeah. Uh, and that's what, you know, financial advice is about is looking at a strategy, looking at the alternatives mm. and coming up with the best way to go ahead with that. So, mm. um, yeah, so for me, for my younger self, I'd say take more risks mm. um, because the ones that I didn't take probably would have worked out better for me. Better for you. Mm. I'll never forget reading um, Robert Kiyosaki, who's an American property investor. He talks a lot about the fact that he has a an accountant, he has a uh, you know a solicitor, he has all these different professionals to give him advice on a, on a property deal that he's going to do. Mm. And because they're part of his team, all of them can come in on that property deal. Yep. Um, and he says it's quite interesting how often they don't, uh, you know, because they tend to be quite conservative in their mindset. Mm. And so they'll lay out to him all of the risks. And he's like, that's their job. That's what I, I pay them for. Mm. And then I sit back and go, right, is this risk worth it? it? You know, is this development, is this whatever it is worth doing? Mm. And he'll be like, yep, I know what the risks are. I've got my advice from my professionals. I'm going to go ahead with this or not. Yes. Uh, and he says it's, it's quite interesting interesting how often they don't actually go through with it because because they're risk adverse mm. yeah they, they all they look at is the risk not the reward at the end of the day yeah yeah, yeah. and that becomes problematic for them mm. Steve, I'm quite surprised tonight. You know, we're only, what, 10 minutes into this and you've already brought up two authors. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I read a lot of books. That's 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 my hobby, is reading. Yeah, no, you've obviously listened to Matt's mantra, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, um, I hit uh, 44 books last year that I read. Oh, wow. There we go. Yeah. Wow. So I'm going to see if I can break it this year. Oh. I don't know if I can. That was pretty hard to hit. <laughs> So, Matt, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is uh, most people wouldn't, wouldn't know that you actually um, have a disability. You, you were actually born with spina bifida. Yes. Um, do you want to explain to our listeners what, what is spina bifida and how does that actually affect your life? Uh, so spina bifida is um, it's a, it's a condition that you don't see a lot of anymore. Um, but, you know, when I was born, I was minted in the 70s and uh, there was a, a bit of it around because we didn't know the benefits of folate and those mm. type of things during pregnancy. But it's basically where the, the spinal cord doesn't form properly, so you, 
your vertebrae don't close up around the spinal cord and uh, you're left with paralysis. Depending on where that lesion is on your spine, it could be mm. on your, you know, anywhere from your neck down to your tailbone. Uh, luckily, I was, you know, born on my L4 and 5 at the base of the spine. Um, so I can walk without crutches, but um, more comfortable with them because I'm you know, much quicker with them. Yeah. Um, and 40 plus years on, um, I'm pretty good with them. Yeah. So, um, and so it doesn't really restrict me too much. Yes, you have certain modifications like car handles and those type of things, but um, yeah, otherwise uh, it doesn't really affect me too much at all. And I'm looking back on your life now, I'm sure it was harder when you're a, a kid or a teenager, but did you think that actually made you more resilient? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, everyone goes through some form of um, you know, trauma or drama as kids, you know, bullying in schools and um, you know, people telling you that you, you, know, you can't get involved in that activity because it might be too hard on you or, or whatever. Um, but I think that does make you more determined mm. to, to do something. And I've always been that way where, you know, if I've set myself a goal of doing something, I've made damn sure that I, you know, take that opportunity to do it because you only get one life. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And for yourself, when it, when it came to, like, choosing a career and, and, you know, going where you're going, I mean, obviously you're not going to go, right, I'm going to be a long-distance runner. That's not going to be my career choice. Did, did it have a lot to actually do for you to say, I'm going to go down finances or not really for you? You sort of just didn't take it into consideration and went where you wanted to go? Um, I think originally when I was uh, younger, I used to watch a show called uh, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Yes. And I remember there was a, a story on the Mirage Hotel Yes. By, uh, Mr. Scaife yes. back in the day. And um, I thought, yeah, I could really manage a, a nice resort like that. And uh, still to this day, I haven't been there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I live the dream um, of, you know, I'd like to go and visit it one day, but not run it. <laughs> <laughs> How much? I actually went into, you know, finance just from, you know, getting a, uh, as a graduate out of university. Yep. Um, I took the opportunity to work in business banking and then it morphed into the financial planning role. Okay. What was it like working in Westpac? It was a good training ground yeah. um, because it was, uh, despite what the media says with the Royal Commission, um, it was very compliant based uh, when it came to giving advice. So we had audits every year and there was, um, you know, some, some fallout there. If you didn't do the right thing, then you got the rat across the, the knuckles. Um, so for me, that was a great training ground, good sales skills. Um, so teaches you some personal skills to talk to clients. Um, so for me, it was, it was uh, a good training ground for where I am today. Uh, yeah. And it just gave me the confidence from there to get out and do it for myself. So, like, with your story and, and where you've come from and, and what you've done, I, I know that you've been working with um, underprivileged people, mm -hmm. particularly financially, uh, in the community. Please share with us a little bit about that. What, what have you been doing? Yeah, so I think, um, and it's probably something that there needs to be more of today because mm -hmm. um, financial literacy um, isn't something that's really sort of spruiked in mm -hmm. schools anymore. Um, so when I was in the bank, one of the community programs was um, getting into the schools um, and talking to year 10, 11 um, students and getting them to talk about finances. And mm. I mean, I know when I was in primary school, we always had the, the bank accounts, that, you know, the old passbook that we yes. have a deposit in once a month for your, your pocket yes. money. Um, and so that was my foray into you know, banking and that kind of thing um, when I was in primary school. But there doesn't seem to be an, a lot of it anymore. And just talking to my own daughter um, about finances, she's starting to work now um, and wanting to save for her first car and those type of things. So it's, um, it, it, it's something that I think is important. Um, we don't do a lot of it um, and just based on what... Um, I'm seeing that they teach in high school, um, it falls short. So there are a lot of people that are falling behind financially when it comes to understanding how, how does money work and how can it impact me if I get it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Hamish and I, you know, we've spoken before about that, that Hills survey that sort of showed that, uh, you know, the, the people under the age of 25 or under 30 are the, are the least financially literate in Australia. Mm. And we don't actually think it's because those people are stupid or silly or mm. whatever else. It's because by the time you get to 50 or 60, you've actually learned it through life. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And we have to actually change that around and go, well, hang on a second. 
in no other area of life do we say, right, you know, you can be an accountant. When you're 50, you'll know what you're doing. Just start working. Yep. You know, you've got to go to uni, you've got to go through it. You know, no one says to a doctor, just jump in, start wing doing surgery, just wing it. By the time you're 60, you're going to be spot on. Yep. You know, you're going to know what you're doing. Yep. You know, whereas when it comes to finances, we tend to do that with our, with our children, don't we? We yep. say, hey, you'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> You'll pick it up as you go. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, and, you know, the problem is when we're young, we don't tend to want to listen that much as well. So that that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, but also, um, you know, what I'm seeing at the moment is this, this culture change where we've gone from don't take on debt mm. to, you know, 50 years ago to only take on good debt, right? mm. you know, 30 years ago to debt's okay doesn't really matter what sort of debt it is, mm. but still have some money in the bank, mm. right, to now you don't even need money in the bank. You just go to, you know, payday lenders or yeah. um, afterpay or, or after things pay like that. Or whatever, yeah, exactly. This culture of, of how we, what reserves we need to have up our sleeves has, mm. has just changed over the years. Yeah. And, of course, we've got this marketing machine that keeps reinforcing this message and, and I think the kids just get swept up in that, you know. Like it's 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 really hard to teach a child mm. um, how, how that is just not good. Because mm. mm. everything's instantaneous now. Mm. Yeah, if we want advice or if we want a product, we can jump online and get your phone and get access to it. Uh, and you can get access to any amount of money you want through personal lenders and that's where people... If they don't have the right understanding and mm. um, behaviours behind it, that's where they can get it wrong. Yeah, look, my son just recently saw, the, saw a Ford Ranger and he was like, oh, I love that car, that's amazing. I, I said, oh, look it up, how much is it? He's like, oh, 35000 base. You know, it goes up, up from there. Mm. I'm sure it goes up <laughs> exceptionally <laughs> high from there. But I said to him, you know, um, well, yeah, if you bought that, how much would it be worth like the next day if you were to sell it? It's like, oh, I don't know. Would it be worth 35000 He's like, oh, no, it'd be worth less. Mm. I'm like, that's right. Mm. So I think it's really important to actually, like, as you go through life, it's about actually just pointing out those those small things, you mm. know, because so it's one of those things that people don't think about until they they do it. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever done it, but I know myself I've, you know, purchased something. I probably should have waited and saved mm. for it. And then, you know, I get it and it's nice. But there's usually some sort of financial, not, not so much about financial hardship, it's usually about stress and anxiety that it then puts on you later mm. when you're trying to pay that back. Yes. And I, I say to myself, you, you really did learn that lesson many times over your life yeah. that you should have just saved for this, yeah. waited the six months or four months or a year or whatever and then purchased it. Mm. And you still have it but without any of the stress and anxiety. Mm. But it's a hard thing to get across to people, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've had, um, I've got one client that comes to mind. He's uh, he's always into buying the, the latest performance car. Yeah. So, you know, Fords or whatever. Um, so every two or three years, he's upgrading the car. Doesn't care about the value that he's losing or the fact that he's borrowing 100% each time. And so he's still got this perpetual debt every year. Um, and he's never going to pay it off unless he stops buying new cars and pays down the debt. Mm. It's a vicious cycle to get into just because you want to be in the I haves. Mm. I, I think what actually makes it really hard now, Hamish, is, is like you were saying, um, there is a concept of good debt. Mm. Do you know, there is a concept of saying actually going into debt for this product or for this investment is is worthwhile. Here are the risks associated with it so you know what you're doing and then go from there. But do you think that actually now we're in this sort of, uh, you know, new world where even very young people have quite high debt, is it hard to, you know, as a financial advisor, to re-explain the difference between good debt and bad debt to people or do you feel that most people understand it straight away? Um, I, I find that there is still that struggle, especially if it's a, a cultural problem or a family, you know, passed down cultural thing yes. uh, or behaviour. Because um, I, I know people where um, the, they've been 21, had a car and they've had credit card debts and the parents who have been bankrupt before have said, ah, oh, just go bankrupt. Yeah. And it is the worst decision you could you can make. So um, I think there is that behavioural thing that we do learn from family or friends that can get us into trouble. Oh, absolutely. But I just I do need to put a caveat in here that the time of this podcast mm -hmm. is the first time since they've invented the wheel that you can actually buy a car and sell it for a profit. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe 12 months ago. <laughs>
<laughs> that's that's because there's been that you know that, that COVID lag of uh, mm. cars being actually created and made. So there's yep. just uh, you know not enough out there. I think the I think the used car market has never <laughs> never been so good before, oh, has it? Well, I mean, look, you know, I, I've got to be at risk of going off track here, but do you realise there's something like sixty thousand cars at the time of us doing this that are off the coast of Port Kembla and Melbourne that can't get delivered? Really? Wow. So there's, so there's some problem with being able to um, fumigate the cars, right, as they come off because of either where they've come from and things like that. Mm-hmm. And so they can't get enough workers to actually bring the cars in, clean them up and get them off to the dealership. So I was actually talking to a guy who's used car sales manager or car sales manager this morning and he was going, yeah, how did you find out about that? Because we're not talking about it much. But <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, when they sell the new car to you, they don't go, it's just off the coast of Port Kembla. <laughs> it's in the new parking lot. <laughs> it's in the new <laughs> parking lot. It's floating. Well, apparently they're estimating 60,000 cars. There's something like 300 ships wow. off Port Kembla. That just waiting to come in. Yeah, mm. yeah. Not to mention the cost of how many thousand dollars a day it costs them just to sit off the coast. Mm. Mm. But like, even looking at that, so you know, as financial advisors and mortgage brokers, you guys are often talking about good debt versus bad debt. Yep. Do you, Do you think people are understanding that these days, or do you think they're finding that difficult to understand? I think the the number of people that are understanding it um, is increasing. Yeah. Uh, especially when they get into investment properties. Yes. Uh, because. The good debt is the one that is tax deductible yes. for you um, in the normal sense. Um, your home loan, it's a debt, but it, the only benefit you get out of that is a roof over your head. Yeah. No tax benefits um, attached to it. So, um, And I think when they come and see a financial advisor, there's other investments that you can get into um, outside of property that have the same benefits for you. Um, plus additional benefits of liquidity. Yeah, and we've often talked about that. It's that whole idea of, of, of knowing what the different investment um, options are, mm. you know. Um, don't get trapped in just one particular option and saying that's all I'm going to do, but actually look around and go, okay, what are these different investment options? What are the different risks associated with that? Which one is going to be best for me and for my money mm. right now, Yep. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I would... Um, suggests that good debt is something where you expect the return to be better than what the money is costing you Mm. over over the right time frame. Mm. So, you know, a home could still be good debt, right, because it's it's an asset that generally has appreciated over time. I mean, one would argue that um, a a whole and 1967 Tirana is mm. a good debt if you borrowed for it. <laughs> you might have bought it for 40 grand and it could be worth $300,000 today, you know. Yeah. So, um, so it's it, after it. but it's understanding those those things yeah, and totally. actually digging into it and getting the right information that mm. the advi- and whether it's advice or, or knowledge is, is the key to it, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I had a client recently actually asked me from the um, property investment side of things saying, uh, you know, is it a problem at the moment with interest rates? Uh, you know, but he was, he was talking particularly in regards to myself being uh, a property advisor and being a buyer's agent. And I said, look, you know, I, I guess it is from a perspective, from people's perspective, mm. but not from my point of view as a professional. Because what I have to do is when interest rates are at, you know, 2%, I'm trying to say to my clients, understand that property is a 10, 15 year game. Mm. Interest rates are not going to stay at 2%. They're going to go to 3 they're going to go to 4 they may go to 5 they may go to 6 mm-hmm. you know, and then they'll go back down again yeah. over that 10 to 15-year period. But when you're at 2%, you just go, oh, that's the repayments. Oh, yeah, that's sweet. That's no problems at all. Mm-hmm. I said, on the flip side now, we're at the pointy end. We're at the higher end. So it's actually saying to clients now, look, I can't tell you that interest rates are going to stay at this level or, or go up, yeah. but over the next 10 or 15 years, we can expect they're going to go down again, mm-hmm. you know. So... It really allows them at the moment to actually um, take that risk on board mm. and see it for what it is rather than it being a risk that may or may not occur further down the track. Mm. You know? It's interesting. I had a discussion with a friend of mine who's a um, general uh, lender for cars and so forth, um, and he was saying that you know, 5% is actually still cheap money mm. um, when you consider the long term. Because I remember back in 2008, interest rates got to 8.5% mm. before the GFC crashed them the market and they went down to where they were at 2%. Um, but on average, long term, interest rates at 5% is still fairly good money. It's just unfortunate that the people in the last 15 years who have gone and bought a home, the first homeowners or the property investors, have just seen the, the 2% interest rate and thought that, yep, that's where it's going to be and we'll stay there. 
Yeah. yeah. So that's where it's now coming unstuck for a lot of people, unfortunately. So, Hamish, you know, from your mortgage breaking background, how, how are people actually handling that moment? Do you think a, a lot of people are going, no, no, I expected interest rates to go up, or are you, are you surprised by how many people just didn't expect to, you know, be in a situation where it might be at 5% or 6%? Uh, look, I think most people know that rates go up and down. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, look, you know, it's the problem that, most Western economies have had lately is they all res- relied on comments that their Reserve Bank chiefs made, which was that money wouldn't go up for another 12 to 18 months. Mm-hmm. So I think there was this, um, you know, we'll be right for a while, all right? Expectation. So, yeah. Um, I, I mean, it, just in the last couple of months, most of the people that we've been talking to have been going, you know what, I've, I've readjusted the budget. I've gotten my head around this now. Um, you know, I, I think I'm going to be okay. So, you know, I think... Uh, I, I, there's going to be some pain, you know, and I'm not saying anyone's going to enjoy going from, say, 2 to 5% or 5.5%, but I think that, you know, we've now had a year where we've been talking about these rate rises and people getting used to it. So um, generally, yeah, I, th- I think people are, are, are understanding. Yeah. I know from the help my wealth side of things when it comes to budgeting, uh, for you know, people I've been talking to, that's been the big thing. I just need to find an extra 150 or two hundred dollars a month or you know, whatever it is. And it tends to be the amount of money that their that their mortgage has gone up by, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so it's about actually sitting down with their budget going, right, let's let's look at this, let's work out where we can actually take a little bit off here, a little bit off there, so that you're actually comfortable, you know. And once you get someone to a point where they their budget is set and and their new rate they're paying is is covered, mm. uh, you know, the, the ease that they have the, the, and you can see the anxiety disappear from, from where they're at. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting that there is a myth that people think that doing a budget is a financial plan. <laughs> Absolutely. That's all I need to do with my life. Yep. Well, look, on that, um, you know, planning for the future, that is what uh, financial planners do, mm-hmm. financial advisors do. You know, you sit down and say to someone, right, you know, you're 30, you want to retire at, you know, whatever X number of years, what are you going to do between now and then? But I, I really wanted today just to ask you, Tell us, what, what is a financial planner? What is a financial advisor? Mm-hmm. What do you actually do for people? I think there's a few listeners out there that sort of, you know, don't 100% know. Yeah, yeah and sometimes financial planners don't know. <laughs> <laughs> With the legislation changes that we've mm-hmm. seen in the last few years, it's um, it's been very difficult to sort of see where the goalposts are now. But mm. um, basically a financial planner um, should be someone who can sit down and talk about your financial situation, where you're at in terms of your debts, your assets, um, what you're trying to achieve long term and in the short term. So if you wanted to buy a home, uh, save for a car, um, go on a holiday overseas or, you know, plan for the kids' education, um, the, the whole financial process um, is about... Um, ascertaining those goals for people Mm. and then putting a plan together to make sure that with the resources that they have that we can try and achieve the bulk of those goals. Well, you may not achieve all of them, but that's something that we need to, you know, tell clients that in all normal circumstances you can achieve this, but this is unlikely if you don't do this. Mm -hmm. So so we can talk about a whole range of things, um, investments inside of super, outside of super, uh, personal insurances, uh, we can help people with um, Centrelink and retirement planning um, and aged care. Um, that's its own specialty that's becoming more and more popular these mm. days, um, which I know Hamish has had a, a fair hand in mm. working with that lately. I don't think anyone wants aged care. No. <laughs> <laughs> but planning for aged care planning is Planning for it, yeah. <laughs> um, and I suppose that's where um, we've changed the perception of the family home is actually an investment asset. Mm. The the debt may not be tax deductible, but now with legislation changing where we can have a downsizer contribution, you can sell your home, downsize to a cheaper home, that's becoming increasingly more difficult because homes have gone up. But um, you can invest that money into superannuation yourself. So if you buy a home and it's in a great area long term, that could be a good strategy for you to build up an asset for retirement. Yeah, it's funny. There was one, there was probably, maybe it was six or seven years ago now, Matt, you might be better at this than me, but um, 
where you sort of got this feeling that the government was trying to strip away all the complexity of the financial rules and trying to make life simpler. But it definitely feels like over the last two or three years that um, the rules have become more complex again. Mm, um, so yeah. there's actually a lot more, I guess, strategies that a lot of people don't know about that we can actually employ to help them with, you know, tax and investing and, and just really making sure every dollar works for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that's where, you know, every year, all the finance nerds like us, we sit down and listen to the budget uh, mm. that the government put out every year and figure out what are the the changes that they're going to bring out and what damage are they going to do. I have this image of you sitting there with some popcorn and, <laughs> you know, a Coke, <laughs> watching yeah. the budget on the news, yeah. your whole family just shaking their head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so look, let me ask you, um, a person comes to you, they say, Ruddy, I want to get some financial advice. You mm-hmm. go, okay, this is what we're going to do. What At the end of the process, what are they ending up with? So at the end of the day, they're, they're ending up with a, a plan or a roadmap um, to the destination. Um there's a lot of work that goes in before that, so we have to look at um, identifying their goals, but also what problems might prop up yeah. um, and stop them from achieving those goals. And then we'll put in a, a financial plan together, we'll research what they have uh, and what they don't have and figure out how we can get there for them. Yes. Uh, but finding out those goals is, is fairly important because if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, as they say. Yeah. Um, and we yeah. want to try and find that, that road of least resistance um, there's always going to be some um, speed bumps along the way, but you know we can try and smooth them out for people depending on the contingency plans that we put in place. I know that for me, when I spoke to my financial advisor and they actually talked about insurances, mm-hmm. you know, for the very first time, I was unaware that I could have certain insurances in my super and then there's certain insurance had to be outside of my super. And, mm. you know, to know that um, my super is is setting up a situation where my family were being looked after if something happened to me mm. was just a fantastic situation to, to have, mm. you know. Yep. So I know that um, there just is so many things that you are unaware of as an average person, yep. you know, that's outside of your field. Mm. So, you know, to come to someone and go, Rodeo, what are the plans? Tell me where we go, mm. you know, what's the tax advantages, you yep. know, what, what's the best investment to, to go with? You know, I've got this much money, I want to try and get to that mm. you know, uh, end point. Yep. How do we do that? <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, when it comes to that insurance discussion, um, that's a perception that a lot of people have is that financial planners are just going to sell me insurance and that's mm. it. Um, but it's interesting, I tend to, when I'm talking to someone who's perhaps in their 20s, no spouse or dependent kids, um, they say, they just stop the conversation and say, well, I don't need any death benefits. Mm. That's fine. What happens if you don't die? Mm. Yeah, what do you do if, you know, you want to go out, have a party and do something stupid and end up in hospital or maimed for the rest of your life. Absolutely. That's you know, when you're going to be making those stupid decisions that you actually need those type of benefits. Yeah. And look, just on that, I, I know that, for instance, um, uh, I wanted to change my insurances at one point mm. and, uh, you know, my financial planner came back to me and I was actually quite surprised. He was... He was unable to do what I wanted because of the rules. Do you know what I mean? And said, no, no, I can't change you unless I can prove that where I'm taking you is actually going to be better. Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, better of some degree, you know. And I'm like, no, just do it. He's like, no, I can't just do it. The rules won't allow me to. Mm. You know, so there are quite a lot of robust rules for you guys around what you can and can't do when it comes to insurances. Absolutely. And it's not just the rules, it's you know, your personal health. Yeah. You know, if you're don't look after yourself and you've had some, you know, health issues, then it makes it quite harder to get insurances or change any of them. Yeah, and, and also the, the earlier you start, the cheaper it is over your whole life. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my my partner is younger than me and my insurance is extraordinarily higher than her insurance because of that difference, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? And and that will continue on for our our whole life. Mm-hmm. It's just not like it changes, do you know? Mm-hmm. So if I can qualify Steve, so probably what you when you mean the rules, like mm. what what we're really talking about here is because you could go to the insurance company yourself and make the changes. Yeah, yeah, right? totally. So it's it's the obligation for the financial advisor to make sure that your best interests are being looked after. Yes, and that's where we can get into a lot of trouble if we're not following those those guidelines or principles of what is in the best interest of interest. the client. Yes. Um, so and that's tricky at times because if the client just wants that. Right. Well, you know, we, we can't we we can't do it 
if we want to stay in business. That, mm. That's the problem. Yeah. But I think it's important for our listeners to know because I think a lot of them just don't realise that financial planners have so many um, over, have so much oversight and mm. so much regulation. Mm. Uh, I think they do sometimes think, oh, this person's just trying to make me do this investment because it's better for them or this insurance because it's better for them. Mm. And, look, maybe back in the 80s that sort of stuff could have happened, but mm. these days the, the regulations and the oversight are so much it's just not possible. Yeah. I mean, look, one of the classics, we've come across, and I think you might have had this once or twice, Matt, is, you know, what got the banks into strife during the Royal Commission was this concept of um, charging fees if somebody's passed away. Yeah. Right? So, but the problem becomes is let's say that person that's passed away has got a million dollars in super and, and it's in stuff that needs to be looked after. All right, so we're not talking about a passive investment. We're talking about direct shares or something mm. that's quite active. Well, the government says you can't actually look after that investment for the client mm. but who is who's actually looking after that investment if you're not mm. so so what you the government's almost forcing us to do is just take your hands off the wheel and just let the the, the, the let it ride let it go wherever it wants mm. and and so this is this is the the problem with regulations is that you know at the end of the day if you said oh should you be able to charge somebody who's passed away on this super you go oh everyone would no no that's a terrible thing to do Mm. but then we've got to look at the alternative and and that's where quite often these things don't do a good job they don't look at the alternative they just look at the first step not the follow through Mm. um so uh sorry if i went down a rabbit hole there but you know (laughs) it, it, it is it's just really important that these rules and the why we do things is carefully thought through, mm. Mm. and not just a reaction to a to a problem. Mm. Do you know? Mm. Yeah. So, look, Matt, talking about financial planning, you know, uh, at what age um, do you think people should be seeking a financial planner from an advice point of view? I mean, there's obviously a, a cost involved in doing that. So, mm. you know, it's a hard thing. And when you're younger, you're like, going, well, I don't have you know money set aside just to be able to do a financial planner. So at what age do you think most people sort of tend to come to you to, to talk through that, that, you know, getting advice? Uh, well, I might start that by saying that I think people should be learning about finances much earlier, like in yeah. high school, um, as I said before. Um, but interestingly, I've just recently seen a, a 18, 19-year-old uh, girl who her parents have said, you need to go and see a financial advisor. Mm-hmm. And so they've paid for that one-hour meeting to come and have a chat and sort out what she wants to do. Um, and, you know, we didn't do a financial plan for her, but during that hour she got a heap of information and um, some context around why she should be setting goals to, you know, save for that home or the car or whatever else it is that she's wanting to do. Um, so I think, you know, as early as you can, and she'd started a career in um, assistant in nursing, so um, they're starting to make money and they need to start making good decisions about it from the get-go. So mm. as early as you can, try and speak to someone about financial advice and that's where the Help My Wealth can really help those mm. younger people. Mm. Mm. So the Help My Wealth is good, but tell us a little bit more about that that sort of meeting that you had with the client. So obviously you didn't do an adv- document, so, mm. so you weren't really giving her advice. No, but it's just talking about the general... Uh, structures of, you know, investing into super and investing into your own name, um, why we save. Budgeting um, is a big issue for a, a lot of people because they all just want to go and spend it, um, have a, you know, a good night on the weekends um, or go and spend it on frivolous things. Mm. Um, if you can talk to them about budgeting and saying, okay, instead of following someone like the, the barefoot investor who says you should open up an account for every single savings plan that you want, um, talk to them about having a working account and a savings plan Mm. uh, in place, whether that's in a a bank account, term deposit, or even a a managed fund somewhere through um, one of the online platforms like Vanguard, Mm. uh, for example. Um, You're not making a recommendation as such, but you're talking about generally what they should be doing to maximise the use of their money Mm. and their time. Mm. Mm. So it's more of an almost like an education meeting rather yeah. than uh, you know an advice meeting sort mm. of thing. So yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, fantastic. So um, you know, I know the question of self managed super funds come up a lot. Mm. I talk to people about financial advice yes. and financial advisors because you know primarily you are the area or the group that actually set those up. Mm. Um, I know Hamish and I, we've discussed before that a few years ago the soft money super fund was was the bee's knees, everyone was talking about it. It seems to have, uh, you know, headed off a little bit lately. Mm. So, you know, 
<clears throat> when do you still bring self management funds in as a suggestion, or where are you sort of at with people? I, I do for some people, um, depending on their situation, and it it probably really took off when they did change the rules in two thousand and seven where they allowed people to actually go and uh, borrow through superannuation to buy property, whether mm. it was commercial or, or residential, um, there was a boom of people, you know, buying properties through their superannuation. And I think that that boom of people is similar to the the, uh, the first homeowners. We have seem to have had a big glut of first homeowners getting into the market. Mm. It's caused property prices to go up and so on. But now the number of first homeowners in the market has dropped. Mm. Same as self managed super funds. People are now not getting into them as much because they've changed the rules. The ATO have now said ideally you need at least half a million dollars in superannuation to make it worthwhile because of the cost of running it and setting it up. Um, that has, you know, ebbed and flow between 200 to 500 back down to 300 over the last couple of years. So, And it's always going to be a discussion point for the ATO. Mm. Um, but I think that's stopped people getting into it. Um, if you don't have enough, our licensee won't allow us to look at anyone under $300,000. Um, we prefer half a million because um, the numbers just add more structure um, and more capability to keep it liquid if they are going to go into a property because you're not putting all of it into a, a single property if you're using a loan. Mm. So um, I think that's the reason it's probably changed uh, so that not a lot of people are using it. But for someone who's self-employed um, and running a business, I would say, yeah, there is a strong case to use commercial property um, to own your, your super fund um, and have the business pay the rent to your super fund for it. Mm. And um, I noticed also that you have um, uh, accreditation in regards to Centrelink in retirement and that sort of thing. I think that's something that people don't tend to think about when it comes to financial advices. So yep. what does that model sort of mean now as we, especially as the baby boomers are getting older, mm. uh, you know, they're very much heading into that um, aged care sort of area. Mm. Um, so Centrelink, retirement, aged care is becoming bigger and bigger for, mm. for you guys. Yep. Um, how is that actually, you know, working out? I think, I think with Soundlink, if you asked anyone whether they like dealing with them, <laughs> no one would say, yeah, I love it. Um, so, But I think that because they do change so much and the media have put out a false message to the public about retirement, so mm. many people still think that they have to retire at 67. Mm. And that's rubbish. 67 is the age <clears throat> that we have to get to to be able to receive the age pension. Mm. If you want to retire early, go, you know, fill your boots. It's the strategies behind that that can help you retire early. So you can access super at 60. Mm. Um, if you've got other assets behind you, you can retire before 60 if you want to. Mm. Um, but it's just that message that, you know, Centrelink have said you have to be 67 to retire. And there's a whole range of strategies around that. There are income streams that we can invest people's money into, give them the surety of a, an income stream for the rest of their life. That reduces their assessment um, for Centrelink purposes and can enhance the the age pension benefit that they get. Um, so that market is changing quite rapidly in the mm. last couple of years. So um, so that's where we need to be, uh, you know, on top of those kind of strategies. And then age care is a whole new beast in itself. Uh, they're, they're always changing the, the field mm. there and Hamish probably has a bit more exposure to that, that case. Yeah, look, I think the hard thing with both Centrelink and aged care is about just getting your expectations right. Like I said to somebody the other day, people, Centrelink, Centrelink, it doesn't really change, right? So the problem is we go in and start talking to Centrelink as if they're an organisation that will have great customer service, right? So, and they're just not manned to do that. Yeah. They're, 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 they're manned to... Um, to solve problems eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go in there wanting something to be fixed tomorrow, well, you are going to be disappointed, all right? So, but if you go in there saying it, it'll get sorted out eventually, then it'll be okay. Aged care, unfortunately, is a similar thing. You know, the, the person that needs aged care tomorrow, it's quite tricky, right? Because it's just not currently staffed or, or funded in a way that allows them to deal with these things. Not off the shelf. No. I mean, to get, um, you know, for the listeners, they might not understand this, but so, you know, one of the first steps with aged care is what's called an ACAT assessment, which is basically where you can find out whether you can get help at home, you know, cleaning, cooking, um, get driving to the shops and that sort of thing. Um, but it can be a 12 to 18 month process to get approved. Um, so I had a 
a gentleman in the other day, a sprightly age of, I think, 83, 84, mm. and um, he said to me, oh, I, I, you know, I want to be organised because I've heard this is, this is a bit of a process. So we started filling out all the forms and, and he was like, oh, do you want help around the house? No. Uh, do you want help cooking? No. Do you need help? Go to shops. No. Okay, all right, let's change this. We're not really answering the questions for today. We're answering the questions for 18 months' time because you're trying to be organised, all right? So so there was this discussion then that basically said, well, you know, unfortunately the questions are even answered as if you need the care tomorrow, mm. all right? But they're not going to deliver on it tomorrow. No. So it's it's just helping people navigate that is is quite tricky. Um, and, you know, let's be honest, as we get older, we don't cope with change and things mm. um, as easily. And so it's it's a harder process. So it's, it's all around the wrong way, all right? And so, yeah, sorry, long-winded answer. But essentially we're here to try and just smooth that out and say this is what you can expect, this is how it's going to work, this is what the funding looks like, this is how we make sure you don't run out of money and so on. Mm-hmm. And, look, I think that's... It's a huge area that people are unaware that you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have older people in my life and that is a fear for them. Mm. Uh, what's going to happen if I need to go to a retirement home? Absolutely. You know, or to a nursing home. Uh, how is that going to be funded? Mm. You know, how is that going to happen? Um, you know, to actually start that process of going, right, this is what we do, this is how it's going to look, mm-hmm. uh, and go from there. It's, it's, it's really important to put those things in place early, early. Mm. Yeah. And not just leave it till you're 85 and then go, I, I need it tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. I mean, my parents are going through that exact same thing at the moment. Um, Dad's, um, you yeah, know, got dementia and a few other bits and pieces and mobility means that he's, you know, at home most of the time, but mum's looking after him. Mm. Um, and then they've got to go through the ACAT assessments because they've had the assessment trying to organise the services for people to come out to do the cleaning, um, help them around with showering and that kind of stuff. Takes a long time, like and, weeks. And, it, and it's political. Like yeah. ap- apparently, locally here and at the moment, there's one um, organisation that has approval for funding but no staff, and there's another organisation that has staff but no funding. Oh, look, it's as simple as uh, you know. I know an older person who wanted to get someone to mow their lawn, and they had it through the ACAT assessment that they could actually do that. Couldn't find someone. <laughs> couldn't find someone to do it. You know, so you've got to actually, you know, get that in early, get it set up, and then and then have it done regularly, and then go from there. Yep. You know, but look, what I'm hearing, um, and what's been really good to talk to you about, is that from a financial planning perspective, whether you are, you know, 25 years old, mm. and it's a conversation of, okay, what are we going to do over a very long period of time, mm. you know, to get your plan in place, uh, whether you're, you know, at the other end of the scale, and you're, you know in your 80s and you're going, I'm worried about where I'm about to head when it comes to, um, you know, aged care and so forth, that uh, you guys look after that whole age spectrum, really. Yes. Yeah. And I think most people are unaware of that. You know, they, they sort of don't see that how much you do within that industry. Mm. Yeah, and it changes constantly. Yeah, so yeah. you always have to be looking at you know, what's changed today. Yeah, and, and I would say it's probably one of the most highly regulated industries that we have probably. Mm. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it is the, the most. most. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, you know, uh, talking to doctors, I think there is some things that we have more controls over what we can do than what mm. doctors do. Yeah. Right. So which is, you know, and I sometimes say to people, think of a financial advisor a little bit like a GP, mm. right? So we're not a specialist, right? So, but we have to know almost every part of the body, yeah. right? Mm. So, but then if something becomes really highly specialised that we need to refer you on to, then we do that. Yeah. Right? And, so. and you know who to refer them on to and mm. who's that best person. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic catching up with you today, uh, Matt. I've really appreciated you coming and explaining the financial planning industry and that idea of, um, you know, making a plan for your future. Mm. Uh, We do ask everyone that comes on here uh, what advice you'd give to your 18-year-old self. Now, you've half answered that earlier on. You said you'd you'd be more risky. Mm -hmm. But other than that, is there anything else that you would uh, would run with? Um, I think, yeah, making... More or taking more risks when it comes to investing and setting goals, those mm. type of things, and um, probably uh, inv- advancing or bringing forward the things that I want to do sooner. Mm. So when I hit forty, I uh, I made it a, a goal every year to have an overseas trip just to escape from work and not be contactable. 
Um, and I was doing that until COVID kicked in. Um, but then in the last 12 months, just, you know, with my um, father going through dementia and a few other bits and pieces there, and I see a lot of clients that get to retirement and don't get to enjoy it because mm. of poor health or, or whatever. So for me, that's changed the way that I give advice to people. Mm. Um, it's if you have a goal of doing something now, get out and do it because you can always make more money, mm. but you can't make more time to go and spend it. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I'm saying. If you want to go and yeah, do that world cruise or, you know, do that stupid thing, mm. go and do it. Yeah, because when you're when you're 85, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to be bothered. You're not going to be bothered. You know, going 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 through the Louvre yeah. or uh, going up the Eiffel Tower is not as much fun when you're 85. No, that's right. So, so I guess the follow up question, Matt, is what stupid thing have you planned for 2023? Well, I'm 50 next year, so I'm planning a big trip next year. But for 23, um, I've just gone and bought myself a a, a toy car that yep. I've wanted for 30 years, actually. Yep. Um, so, I just thought, no. Nah, no point being the richest corpse in the graveyard. So I just found a car that I've wanted and uh, gone and bought it and have a bit of fun with it. Fantastic. Now, look, the other question we ask all of our guests is if you're going to write a book, <laughs> what would its title be? What would it be about? Well, obviously it's going to be about the journey that I've had, but yeah. um, the journey's not done yet, so that's probably the title. <laughs> the journey's not, not done yet. Not done yet. Not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a hard question, actually. Um, there's plenty of different titles I could use, but, um, yeah, as I said. Maybe you can start a series. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do a Where Are We Now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How about you, Hamish? Have you, you thought through your uh, your book title yet? Uh, I think you've asked me this question before, Steve. Um, so, um, yeah, look, I, the, the problem is is that I think a book title needs to be something that catches people's attention. So if it's boring, well, I'll probably be the only one that reads it. So <laughs> so I've got a few catchy sort of phrases that I would sort of use that might just end, end up people just at least picking up the book and and, uh, and 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 having a bit of a look through it. So, you know, and, and one of them, you know, was let me tell you about the time that I was naked with the Prime Minister's wife. <laughs> we have had this discussion had before, this <laughs> but you're going to have to tell people what it is because otherwise those new listeners will be going, what the heck? Well, unless we wait to the next podcast and then maybe we talk about it a bit further then. So, um, you know, any preference there or do you want me to...? No, well, I think you need to, you know, there's, there, people are shocked. Cats yeah. out of the bag. Yeah, no, yeah. that's right. <laughs> so... Malcolm Fraser was the Prime Minister and it turned out he went to the school I went to in primary school. And so when most people in New South Wales get to go to the um, Canberra for their like year six trip, we got to go to Canberra as well, but we got to have lunch at the Lodge because Malcolm Fraser was the Prime Minister at the school. As you do. Mm. So, um, so, and so we were at the Lodge and I um, fell into the fish pond. And so um, I got whisked upstairs by Tammy, his wife at the time, and uh, stripped down to my underwear so all of my clothes could get, could get sent off to get washed and, and dried. And uh, so while the rest of the class was sitting downstairs, you know, asking Malcolm Fraser and Tammy heaps of questions, I was stuck upstairs in my undies watching TV, basically. Just, and, just chilling out on their bed. And I don't even, know, don't even think I had undies on. It was probably <laughs> just a towel. <laughs> So, you know, so for a brief moment there as you know, Malcolm's wife sort of, you know, told me to get undressed and everything, you know, so I wasn't the same age as the Prime Minister's wife. But, you know. <laughs> the question was, well, you're sitting there in the in the Prime Minister's robe, you know, watching TV butt naked. <laughs> oh, look, you know, it's possible. I'm just going to leave it open. Did, did Malcolm come back that night, put on his robe and go, this is a lot wetter than I thought it would be? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I was long gone by then. Yeah. <laughs> Bubbles on that. Well, Matt, look, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. As always, guys, at uh, Help My Wealth, we're all about empowering your financial journey. I hope that today we've been able to do that by talking to Matt Skeen. Matt, thank you so much for coming. It's been good to talk to you about the financial planning industry and your journey through that. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Yeah, thanks, guys. The information discussed by the Help My Wealth and the Money Rules, Money Rules podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only and is generally nature and it is not advice. It is not intended as a substitute for professional finance, legal or tax advice. 
It is aimed to provide a general understanding of each topic and should not be relied upon to make an investment or financial decision. It is strongly suggested that you seek professional advice regarding your own individual circumstances before making a financial decision. Help My Wealth and the hosts of the Money Rules and Money Rules podcast are not aware of your personal financial circumstances. Before making any financial decisions, you should read the product disclosure statement and, if necessary, consult a licensed financial professional. Do not take financial advice from a podcast. In the spirit of reconciliation, Help My Wealth and the Money Rules or Money Rules podcast acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to past, present and emerging elders. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today.